To our people, Polidero Canyon is a very sacred place. There is a spirit there. Palo Duro Canyon is indeed sacred. A historic battle took place within this canyon, the last major battle of the Red River War, the final stand before Kiowa, Comanche, and Southern Cheyenne Indians were forced onto reservations. This looks like this is probably a piece of tin. It's thin. Yeah. yeah. And now tribal elders have teamed up with archaeologists to try to uncover the secrets of a 130-year-old battle, a chance to return the spirit of the Southern Plains Indians back to Palo Duro Canyon. For as long as this canyon has been a state park, Palo Duro has lured campers, hikers, and mountain bikers. But now it's attracting archaeologists. They're here to explore this new addition to the park, close to 8,000 acres of untouched history. We're very excited at Palo Duro Canyon, not only because it adds to the beauty of the park itself, but it's historically significant because it was the final battle in the Red River Wars, the Battle of Palo Duro Canyon. Quiet in the rank. Back on September 28, 1874, the U.S. Cavalry, under the command of Colonel Ranald McKenzie, snuck down into the canyon with plans to ambush several Indian tribes that were settling into Palo Duro for the coming winter. McKenzie made the decision to launch a surprise early morning attack to catch the Indians completely off guard. Yeah! Yeah! Charge! McKenzie was successful in getting his troops down into the canyon, caught the Indians completely by surprise. Come on. Come on. And it turned out to be a rout on the part of the army against the Indians. And it was the turning point that finally forced those Indians, made them realize we have no choice. We can't stay out here on the plains without food and without transportation. And they began drifting back to the reservations. You listen to the stories and you look around and you think, how did they? How did our people ever get out of here? Now, over 130 years later, descendants of those Kiowa and Comanche Indian tribes have returned to the battle site, to this new piece of public land. Here to pay their respects, <coughs> and to help Parks and Wildlife archaeologists unearth some answers. A lot of the elders who may have known certain aspects of a certain accounts, historical accounts, that they don't, they're not here with us anymore. They've, um, they've gone on. Well, see, they came down on the village here. So it's important for our children, our young people, to understand where we came from, why we are here, why we are Comanche, and how we are going to be Comanche. Yeah, it's a nail. What we're trying to do here is to bring in both the Native American perspective and to collect data that can add detail and scope to the overall story. The jingle. The jingle. It sure is. Uh -huh. It's handmade. See? It is. Look. And then oh, yeah. here. It's a cone, the bottom of a dress. Or it'd be sewn onto a moccasin. And it makes a beautiful tinny sound. The ultimate goal is to follow geographically the route of the battle as it progressed through the canyon. When you come to a site... There's three rocks right there, look. There is a spirit there, and that spirit is what kind of draws you, and you kind of get a sense, a feeling. James Coverdale relies on his Kiowa heritage when he searches sacred sites. Some of these objects that are found here, it's the first time someone's seen them for 100, over 130 years, and to actually find an object that may have been, you know, from my great, great, great grandfather. That's what I think about when I find something. Most of the artifacts left behind were made of metal, so those metal detectorists look and listen. OK, that means there's something down in there. We don't know what it is. It's in that clod somewhere. So it's in here. If I didn't drop it, there it is. It's just a piece of tin, I believe, and they've been chiseling on it to make their air points out of. As the metal detector survey progresses, 
and people locate items, those items are removed from the ground, placed in plastic bags, and pin flagged in place. This is Artifact 34, piece of crimp metal. A later crew will then follow with GPS mapping equipment. And plot it. Once we bring them into the lab and get them cleaned up, washed up, then they go through a chemical bath, essentially, that will stop that corrosion process. Les Eason is a curator in training. And probably the most important thing is to make sure you don't get any scratches on the artifacts. You don't want to compromise the artifact at all. They've already been through quite a bit. We use soft tools like the toothpick, um, just so it's not really abrasive or anything. It's kind of neat to think that this was worn by somebody 130 years ago, and uh, what it might have meant to them uh, is a decorative piece. It's just nice to see the work in its final stage. Let's see what we got. Once stabilized, the true inspection is underway. Then we're at the point where we can actually begin the analysis of them and uh, study some of the details. We think this piece may be a handmade, an Indian-made horse bit. Close to 1,000 artifacts have been unearthed and cataloged. This is the 45 caliber Springfield cartridge and the 45 caliber bullet that would have been with the cartridge. Uh, this was the cartridge and bullet that was being used by the Army in 1874. This is a 50 caliber musket ball that we recovered from the battle site, and it's clear evidence that the Indians were using whatever firearm type that they could get their hands on. Other domestic type items that we found there included axe heads that the Indians were using. This item is typically referred to as a food grater. Uh, they punched a lot of holes all through it. Uh, this is a naja, naja being a Navajo term that means pendant. This piece would have been made by the silversmiths in New Mexico and then traded to the Indians for them to wear as a pendant. Yeah, you're getting some good results there. After months of study, those GPS computer graphs of recovered artifacts begin to provide some answers. You can see that the natives are continuing on up and out of the canyon here and here. But there are still areas that archaeologists need to search, unknown details yet to be discovered, all in hopes of being able to tell the true tale of the battle at Palo Duro. We have the opportunity to look at the pieces of the puzzle as they were dropped 130 years ago. It's now our task and our challenge to start putting those pieces back together into a way that tells us the whole story. We really need to give our Comanche children a sense of the history, a sense of the power, so it goes on into the future. If we don't do that today, the people who died here died for nothing. <laughs>